Welcome to the Deer Society Podcast. Here's your host, Brian Lemke. Well, hey everybody, welcome back to the Deer Society Podcast. I'm Brian Lemke, joined today by Mike Ducart, JJ Ducart, and Mr. Andy Orwell with AWS. How's everybody doing today? Doing good. Got some good rest. How was the drive up here, Andy? Always long, but just kind of put it in autopilot and go. You've probably been a busy guy here as of late. Spring's busy time. A little bit, yeah. A little bit just finishing up and tired to, or tired of hearing a chainsaw and happy to be done with it. <laughs> well, glad to have you up. We're going to be talking today. We're taking an in-depth look at the Whitetails from Scratch property. Andy and AWS were up and have done a ton of habitat work and planning strategy right from the start when you guys first got the Whitetails from Scratch property. So we're kind of going to talk about that. And now we're three years, three years, almost four years in. Yeah, going close to four. Three yeah. years since Andy cut. May yeah, of 2019 was first hinge right. cut on this Cedar your fourth, fourth year. Fourth year. Yeah, moving in. So, so we're at the point where we're seeing some results now on that property. Obviously, you guys shot some killer deer off the property last year. So we're going to talk about that. Andy being up, this is the first time you've actually got to see those bucks from this past mm-hmm. fall. So we're going to be talking everything Whitetails from Scratch property, habitat work, and uh, just some updates there. So, JJ, I'll, I'll let you rock with it. Where do you want to start? Well, I know when we had the, was it a planning podcast that was more habitat type? you know, mapping out the property. We talked about Andy, set some goals, kind of, you know, walk through the whole property where food plots go, overall strategy, hinge cut, water, all that good stuff. Um, and I remember Mike saying, yeah, we're really looking for those eight-year-old bucks. And yeah. um, and now I look over at the table and it's five and six-year-old. So maybe we didn't hit our goal there, but we do have an eight-year-old buck to hunt this year. So we do. So with that in mind, that'll be our strategy this year. Mm-hmm. Those bucks are getting older every year, living on that farm, relating to it. You guys are mastering their patterns and understanding, you know, how they're using the farm. And, and that transfers, whether it's a two-year-old, three-year-old, seven-year-old, eight, 10, 11, beyond. I'm happy, those, those I'm happy with use. a six-year-old buck. I don't right. know. Anybody's happy with a six-year-old buck, but it sure is neat to see those older ones. What, anytime. Did, what, yeah. what does it take to get an eight-year-old buck? Just, Luck. You know, well, it takes, it takes time and yeah. And, and you, of course you're working on your years. habitat so that what? Eight years. Eight, yeah. Eight, eight years. That's what I was looking for. JJ's the one. Eight, 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 eight years. years. Yeah. Acres isn't a bad answer either, really. If you've got 5,000 acres, it gets a little that easier, helps, but, yeah. but, uh, yeah, you know, time on the farm and, um, th- them relating to your habitat and not, uh, spending as much time on neighbor's farms and getting, you know, shot injured, wounded, not making it through, all those are important elements. And you guys are, you know, you're working in that direction on all of those. And that's why you've got eight-year-old buck showing up and uh, beyond, you know, like I said, eight-year-old is is a fantastic uh, buck, but you can go past that too. I know, you know, Ryan's had some amazing luck with even older bucks. I think he's the only guy I know that's ever killed uh, three nine-year-old bucks. That's, that's an amazing feat as a whitetail hunter. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. That's that's wild. Uh, seldomly do you ever get a chance to even, you know, see a nine-year-old buck or have one on your property, but shoot mm-hmm. three, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, and you guys are, you know, you're you're moving into a situation where you're also um, cataloging those bucks well enough to even understand that, you know, because once you're past, say, five years old or so, it gets really difficult to tell, hey, is that buck five? Is he eight? Is he 10? Who knows? Yeah, you know, and, and we're still learning too, because like you say, we're cataloging the bucks, so... To build up that, we got to find out how many, you know, four and a half year olds can sustain that property and five and a half year olds. So that's kind of our base, if you will, to to get to that eight and a half. And very few, if any, will get to eight and a half because of the pressure mm-hmm. of, you know, the neighbors and, and just, you know, getting sick and fighting and pushing each other off. So when I said we wanted to hold, you know, six to eight and a half year old deer on the property, it's because they don't. They're not that tolerant of each other. And I'm not convinced that because the eight and a half year old and the six and a half that JJ shot skyscraper did crisscross a specific area that Andy set up with hinge cutting and great habitat that they didn't cross paths and decide that they were going to battle for that spot. Now, 
the reason I say that is because we thought, remember, we, he had a big cut under his arm. And I mean, he was tore wide open. You could look inside of his, of his skin. It was pretty wow. bad. And he was limping. And we thought, well, he might not survive. But he did survive. And he did hold that territory. And uh, was able to, I guess, function around the, which will be the eight and a half. So what? Mm -hmm. I think. Walk me through that a little bit, Jay. Yeah, so guy scraper got hurt. We don't, it's hard to know which buck he got into a fight with. Um, but there's, you know, five-year-old that you shot, little splitter. He, it, Eight-year-old, we'll, we won't throw a name out there yet on him until he's, till he's, he's in the hunt breakdown. Um, but I can't think a couple of other ones. But once they get that five, six, they are just beating each other up. Yeah. And if you can't separate them enough mm -hmm. with, the, with the habitat. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what, what do you think it takes? This is actually a good way, direction to go. I like this. So what's it going to take to have an eight and a half and a six and a half and even a five and a half, but a five and a half is not going to challenge an eight and a half most likely, unless he's feeling pretty good about himself. Well, Andre the Giant would. Yeah, I might, I might, I might um, question well, that a little bit. I have seen a lot of that. The four and five year old bucks are generally, it's almost you could equate them to like, you know, 20 or 25 year old. Uh, let's say men or whatever, and, right. and a bunch of forty-five-year-old men around. They're 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 willing to jump in there, and you know they're they're extremely athletic, and they're generally highly motivated to breed and and buy those does and whatnot. And they will battle. I've seen a lot of four-year-olds start fights with anything, just anything that's walking, because they're just they're in a fury a lot of times, you know. Well, let, let me walk you through my experience. I hunted pretty much dominantly the west side of the property. And no specific deer that were on the east side of the property didn't show up in my area when I was hunting. Now, I'm not going to say they never showed up there on camera, but they really didn't show the, up on camera and, and like in the bat mm -hmm. line because I was hurt. So what I watched is I watched the two and a half year olds, the one and a half year olds, the three and a half year olds, and a four and a half year old. And I watched their behavior. I watched how they were interacting with each other. And I knew there was the five and a half year old little splitter. He was on my side too. And I actually, I think I did jump him one time, but what I noticed is the ones, the twos, the threes, they're still trying to figure out life. They would still interact and still be in the same field at the same time. But when the four and a half year old showed up, he was having none of it. He did not want to interact, didn't want to hang with any of them two, th twos and threes or ones. And a little more angry. In fact, he flattened you know, my decoy. And, uh, when he showed up, everything else would just fade off. So what's happening from, and, and I don't think, I, I suppose that four and a half would have fought the five and a half. There's, the, it, it, I could see of that Of course, happening. there's no hard and fast rules either. It depends on the personality of the buck. Some bucks are super aggressive. Right. Others are just, you know, I know we love to put them into categories because it makes it easier to understand, but the, 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 Real uh, fact of the matter is that it depends on some on their personality as well. You know, you might encounter a four-year-old that wants nothing to do with fighting anything and doesn't even breed hardly, and other ones are just just raging all over the property, fighting anything they can. And I think the the real principle you're, that that is important on your farm is it's almost like a city. What what would make what would make a bunch of males humans in this case? tolerate each other in the, in the format of a city, it, that, that compact and that power, it's the resources. It's right. always the resources. They're willing to do that because they have all the resources. Namely, there's lots of females in the city and there's lots of work in the city, lots of food and there's lots of water and drinks and everything, all the things that, that the, that these people might want. And with the bucks, it's the same. When you get that hinge cutting project done and you get ponds put in all the correct locations and great food on the entire property laid out in, in those systematic ways. Now those bucks are, they're, they're put, they're put in a much tighter proximity. And so they have to tolerate each other somewhat because they're in tighter proximity. You know, they, they, they're willing to bed down on it. And that's another thing that that visual cover on the ground does is provide where, Hey, because if it doesn't, if, if a whitetail buck doesn't see another whitetail buck, generally he's not going to be too too much in a you know in, in in the mood to fight him. Or but when he sees him walking on a ridge fifty yards away, he's going to be in a fury. He's going to be pissed off. All right, I've got to go fight him right now. You know. So it, I, I guess the point really is coming full circle now. So let's just say hypothetically that skyscraper ran into the eight and a half, and mm -hmm. they had it out because they're in the same area mm -hmm. because it's so heavy and it's so thick over there. One may have a pure be dominant bedding area, 
where the other one would not go into, mm -hmm. and the other one would have his bedding area. Now, the fact that they probably weren't visually seeing each other because it's so thick over there um, made it so that it was tolerable after they clashed one time. So now they could almost kind of sense and smell each other, and they don't necessarily want necessarily butt heads mm -hmm. and serve as does in those specific areas in their own areas. So they could be they could tolerate each other as long as they weren't too close to each other. Mm -hmm. so even though one either won or lost the battle, and it didn't even have to be the eight and a half year old. It could have been another one, another deer. Um, skyscraper still stayed in his core area and patterned him that way for two straight years. And that's how we, we took him, mm -hmm. but he didn't get pushed out of there by that bigger eight and a half that we know was literally yeah. walking in the same deer trails that he was walking in because we mm -hmm. saw it on camera. Again, yeah, that, so re that was the tolerable. Res resources, they're willing to tolerate it because they, they want what's there badly. And that's what you're trying to do on your entire farm. Imagine if your farm was a complete barren open field with nothing. Then there's almost no resources there. You're going to have almost no deer. But when you start stacking in those, all those elements, stacking and stacking and stacking, all multipliers for how many bucks can live on that farm and, and survive and have the food they need and the resources they need. And that's what, you know, you're going to reach a, you're going to reach critical mass at some point for sure and start to overflow. And, you know, I, I think you guys are getting there when you start having eight and a half year old bucks marching around the farm, you're, you're getting to a place where. I think there's two really good things that I want to kind of hit on there. That's all really good stuff. Two things. One is absolutely resources. The other thing too, I think that you have to take into account is not only resources, but pressure right? Internal mm -hmm, pressure yeah. and out uh, and external pressure. Big so, time. you know, white toast from scratch farm there, it, it's been known over the years to have lots of external pressure. One of the things that makes it really good now is one, you've, you guys have built the resources and two, you don't put hardly any pressure on that farm internally whatsoever. So those bucks, they're smart. They're older. They're smart. They know where there's pressure. If they can have the, the access to those resources, I would guess that they're willing to put up with a little more deer activity to escape that external pressure from the outside. Would you agree? Yeah, I think that's reasonable. When you got a lot of human pressure around it, they're definitely not going to leave it as much. Yeah. The other thing that it's more of a question than, it, than anything, and I think you can look at the way deer tolerate, tolerate each other uh, in a few different scenarios, but this scenario, these two bucks have been on this farm for quite a while together, right? So like you have history with these bucks for multiple years. So we're not talking about a deer that's a homebody and then a new buck coming in that hasn't been there and he's coming in. And, and I feel like these bucks know each other at this point, right? They've dealt mm -hmm. with each other for several years, right? So, you know, their personalities have had to align at some point and they've figured out that that arrangement, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's something that you have to look at where if it was a brand new buck that moved in there, you have a six and a half year old buck living in there, and then you have a brand new eight and a half year old buck or whatever that comes in there, you know, those deer might might handle each other differently because they don't know each other. When you look at, you know, maybe skyscraper and this other deer, I feel like that may be, you know, interesting just because they've really grown up, you know, at least for mm -hmm. the last several years with each other. So I, I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there, you know, as a thought, I don't know if that makes a difference or not. Yeah, no, the only thing I can say to that is, you know, we always, I try and explain to clients that, you know, when you do these hinge cutting project and put that framework in place and then start to layer these other, other elements in, you're, you're going to have deer that are growing up in that system. And those are really the deer that um, over the long haul, those are the ones that are going are gonna to live on that property. You're going to get some transient bucks come in from other properties and things, but that's not going to be the primary thing that happens. Primarily, you're going to have deer growing up now in these systems and realizing, hey, every time they leave the property and go somewhere else, they realize this isn't as nice as where I came from. I'm going back. And so they start, and then of course, as bucks, most bucks, I hate to just say flatly bucks, because again, it's always personalities, but most bucks, as they mature, as they get older and older and older, their core areas shrink and they just start to realize, hey, I don't really have to, you know, they're just getting smarter is what it amounts to. When a, when a buck's three years old and he smells anything on the wind, he just, you know, that's why they're getting hit all, on the road. And, and, you know, you hear, oh, I have a trail camera picture of that buck and he's three miles from here, you know, because they're just, they're, they're willing to cover more ground. They're exploring and whatnot. But 
um, their their core areas shrink and shrink, and so you end up with those two bucks now are just have both isolated and said, "Hey, I'm going to live here." Well, I'm going to live here too. Well, you know, once in a while they might battle a little bit, but they're they're going to come to a. It's dangerous for them to fight, so they're going to come to a place eventually where they're using scent and uh, you know marking techniques to say, "Hey, well, this is mine." Well, I hate you. This is mine. So. <laughs> Yeah, I think in back to Brian's point too. Our our property gets better throughout the season too, as more and more gun because we shot our bucks post gun season, mm-hmm. late November. When was yours? I don't remember. Early December, <clears throat> or both late November. Or there was there wasn't any snow on the ground. And our, I mean, they just more and more bucks just keep coming in throughout the year. Right. So you get bucks that might spend you know twenty percent of their time on your property and eighty percent on the neighbors. Well, that might shift to well now it's twenty percent on the neighbors and eighty percent on yours as the season pressure is shoving. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really... In fact, now they bring that up. I was wearing orange, so it had to be during some type of firearm season, and uh, it was heavy pressure outside mm-hmm. of the of the area. It had been for a. A number of weeks, actually. And of course, that's exactly just precisely what you're trying to create yep. in the mind of whitetail bucks in your area is that place is safe. Yep. That place has better food. That place has a deep cover, heavy, heavy hinge cut, deep cover, you know, that I can just squat down in and nobody can shove me out of there. In fact, the other five and a half year old bucks showed up that specific week because of the pressure from the outside the one that's still alive. You know, what's interesting about this whole deal is like a looking back at, at, you know, you guys shooting these deer and during the gun season and like little splitter, you shot over a food source basically during a gun season. You know, I can remember growing up as a kid and, and he'd go out in the, the first day of gun season or the first week of gun season. And, you know, you'd hunt in the morning, you'd hope a deer ran by you, you know, from the, somebody pushed him by you. And then you'd hunt through the afternoon and there's like, okay, well, I'm going to go out in the evening. And it's like, well, theory should tell you you should hunt over a food source, but there was no way in hell that you were going to sit over a food source because you're like, a deer's not going to come out there. They've been getting blasted out all day. Now, it's a completely different scenario, right? Mm -hmm. But it's it's interesting because these deer obviously feel safe there, right? They, They feel safe enough to come out in the open to a food source during the gun season with all the blasting going on. And during daylight. And during daylight. That's that's mm-hmm. the absolute most important thing about it. Um, so just a, an interesting thing to think about. Yeah, and, and not only deer, but mature bucks. A completely different animal. Yeah. You know, that's a completely different animal. Yeah, and I know we talked about this in the past too, about skyscraper hunt, but that, that day we were both hunting. You were far west, I was east. Right. Gunshots, like just people target practice, driving, you know, oh. whatever they're doing, just firearm, boom, 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 all night. I call my buck out of the bedding, you know, to be able to call your deer in an hour and a half before dark with all the gunfire going around. Yeah. I mean, that's, that, they feel that's comfortable. That's a great point because we were, that that gunfire was loud. Yeah, I was and I'm thinking, jumping out of the tree. Geez, where's that shot come from? And then all of a sudden there was more and more, and I'm like, well, that's target practice. Somebody's getting ready for the weekend. And it was loud. And I, I'm thinking to myself, it's got to be pretty close to JJ. I bet he's ticked, you know. Sure, so all of a sudden, vroom, vroom, yep, look down at my phone. What the heck? Vroom, vroom, you know, getting all worked up, you know. And I'm like, hey, just, just, just stay in there, hang in there. You, you know? start to get worried, like, where are these bullets going? Well, that too, because it sounded like they could be coming our way even at some level, but. So we had a little discussion on that. But. And those bucks are slowly, you know, step by step learning that, okay, the same as you guys, that, that's not here. That's not on my property. You guys know that's not on your property. They're plenty capable of that level of thought, realizing, hey, that's n- the, they're not shooting at me. I'm safe. I'm sitting in my, my sanctuary, and they're not shooting at me. Well, just, like, they, just like white tails near a trap shooting range. Yeah, exactly. Uh, my or son started trap shooting. Or, or anything, yeah. you know. And, you know, and then they ran out of ammunition, obviously. And, uh, or money. Or money, one or the <laughs> other. And uh, all of a sudden I get, woo, woo, look down. I think it said skyscraper is dead or something like that. I think that's exactly what it said. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, how did that happen? It couldn't have been at thir- a 20 to 30 minute span after they quit shooting in the daylight hours. And all of a sudden I get that text that he's dead. Well, he called him right off the bed. Right that out of the hinge cut. So cool. So cool. It's true. I mean, I was close to that deer. Yes. Because we went, you know, shed hunting and we walked around trying to figure out, I kind of knew where he was. 
afterward. But yeah, I mean, we sat, we were together, you know, walking like, oh, Brian, this is where he was bedded. And like my trees, you can almost see my stand. And I just, little doe, little doe asterisk, buck grunts, and mm -hmm. just popped out of there. So it was a... Because he's habituated to that entire area. And I was what so happens close there? He's used to, to him. He's like, oh, to him. you know, they must be, that must be real. Didn't see a hunter, you know, yeah, walk up. Never heard and, anybody sneak yeah. in, never heard a thing, just and, the and right I, sound, the right sound at the right time. And I, I want to I wanna kind of add to that, right sound, right sound. I, I don't tell too many people about why and how I developed the deer call, but... I can tell you one thing, JJ is not like Mr. Supercaller where he wants to be calling all the time. In fact, it's the opposite. And so I know that that calling was very subtle and it was very natural and it was probably not much of it either. I don't, how many notes do you think you kicked out totally? Like five, six. Yeah. Some real light doe esters bleeds post rut and some younger contact grunts, just a little, little sequence. And a mm -hmm. human would not be able to hear that at 50 yards, but a deer could pick it up at 40 yards easily. Yeah, especially on a windy day. Because it know. wasn't the Buck Croaker 2000. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> With the big horn on it. <laughs> Well, I want to I want to jump back a little bit here. So, you know, we haven't done a, a the the last podcast we did with you, and it was quite a while ago. So, I want to jump back and kind of pick your brain. And we get asked this question a lot, like, what do you look at when you get a new property for the first time? And I want to kind of jump back to your first experience coming up, looking at the White Tails from scratch property. Mm -hmm. You know, and if the, anything now, years later, like, what stands out to you when you look back at the first time you looked at this property? You know, how did you approach it or what was your mindset, if anything, sticks out at this point years later? Specifically with that property? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, the first thing always I'm looking at when, I, when we start with a property is trying to understand, okay, how can they access this? Because really that determines an awful lot. How can they get to different parts of this farm in, from a hunting perspective? You know, how, if, if that back timber on the east side, you know, how can they get there? You know, you remember, I remember talking with you about that. How, all right, how can you guys get on this property? And that's another component of, you know, the newer property that you added on the northern side. That's, that gives you access to some magic, magic Huge. stuff for sure. And we just bought a uh, piece of machinery that will allow us to start, cre we haven't really done much for access creation of access yet either. Mm -hmm. As far as so, trails type, yeah, type, so type that's, system. That's right. next. Uh-huh. But that's a, that's a huge component is trying to understand how they can get to certain areas of the farm because really you can't start laying out a lot of the other elements of the framework until you know, our, you know what good does it do if I set up a beautiful system that's on the back southern side and they can't get access it or get there at all, you know. Um, so that's a, a super important component. And then you're looking at uh, the trees, where, wh what kind of framework of hinge cutting can I put in place? What's there? What's available? You know, if it was, imagine if that whole farm was all those big cedars that are on the kind of the eastern side. If it was all just grass with those giant cedars in it, well, that dictates one exact thing that you can do with that farm. You know, versus okay, there's chunks of timber. What kind of timber? What do they look like? What what kind of food uh, capacity do, do those have? And and uh, trying to understand that aspect of it, and then you know kind of planting tree stands at the same at the same time like okay we could we could have some systems in here you know and trying to isolate each one of those systems on the farm and, and create those little kind of cells of you know great bedding uh, great food great water and a great tree stand location with great access trying to create as many of those as you can on the farm that's really the essence of it so first impression what was what would you grade it when you looked at it right away the farm, I, it, yeah, I loved it, but I was concerned, you know, I had concerns for sure of, about exterior pressure. It's, you know, it's very much a farm of concentrated, great cover and, and deer cover that, you know, they're going to, with all the ag surrounding you on all sides, you're always going to have an issue with, okay, you know, these deer are going to want to leave and get onto that ag. An inside out property. Yeah, you know? for sure. There's no way you can, no way you can completely stop that. What you can try and do, or what, what I can try and do with some of the habitat work is delay that. So that they're not doing it until after dark, because I don't care if they go onto your neighbors after dark, because they can't shoot them. Hopefully, well, they can. Well, hopefully, well, <laughs> well they can. They can. But hopefully, uh, well, right. I'll tell you what. Oh, we it, it took a few years, but we did finally establish through a number of different things that happened the outside pressure. Now, 
I mean, and one is building a, a more solid relationship with your neighbors. Mm-hmm. Um, two is finding out where they're at. Do they want to participate in, you know, a management program? So now you expand this, this footprint, you know, in a, mm-hmm. in a much wider, bigger area. So there's more deer, there's more deer habitat. They'll flow through more of the properties. Mm-hmm. Some of that happened. Um, and then you got your, you know, just running gunners uh, and just, you know, me, I'm going to call them meat hunters and I'm not using that negatively. And, you know, they just, they're not, they do what they do and they don't own the property. They just get permission and they hunt mm-hmm. it. Well, we were able to purchase the piece of property that the majority of that was happening on. And so that worked in our favor. And then finally, there's still a couple of, of, of things that we're still trying to work with, but the one neighbor um, purchased a piece of property um, that was basically, a, I would say, a transition piece to our, our spot would be a good example of it. And after taking a number of deer over several years, they've kind of understood what we're doing by watching what we're doing and come to the conclusion, hey, we want to start doing more of that. So they're, I'm going to say, kind of graduating to other lev- another level. Mm-hmm. So rather than just, you know, get excited and kill the first year they see, which there's nothing wrong with that, because if that's where you're at with your hunting, you know, well, yeah, the, I career, think I mean, you know, at, at some point you have to be at a point where you want to get the bigger deer. You know well, that I mean? Yeah, that happens in two ways. It happens as individuals. Right. You have a transition and a, and a flow movement in that direction. And that's generally, starting to happen with them now. Generally. But then you also have within deer hunting as a, as a pastime, as a sport, as a, as a lifestyle, that also there's a transition happening in that direction as well. As, as people realize, oh, you know, a four-year-old deer is not mature. A five-year-old deer is not necessarily mature. You know, people are looking. That's changed within my lifetime. I've seen a huge change in the way people think about, in general, about deer hunting. And so you have that happening within the framework of the industry and, 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 the, and the lifestyle, but you also have it happening as individuals. And when people, a lot of times what I see what happens is when people encounter that, as they did in your case with you guys' farm, all of a sudden, they're doing what? They're do- what? And hinge cutting? And they're putting in pond? What? And they're doing all this habitat work? They encounter that, and then that gets people thinking a lot of times, like, hmm, that's interesting. And then maybe they see some footage or this or that, and they encounter that. And so it just plants seeds of, hey, you know, maybe I will. You know, when the when the bow is drawn, and, and he's three years old, and he's coming underneath him, and I think, well, I could let him walk. You know, and starts to plant seeds as an individual, but then also within the industry and, and everybody doing, you know, everybody kind of going in the same direction. People are planting food plots now, commonly for whitetail hunting. Mm-hmm. And and 15 years ago, that just really wasn't happening. Yeah. People leave a little bit of corn or a little bit of beans in the field, and that was a food plot. That was it. You know, yeah. and now people are planting all a huge spectrum of things, trying to, you know, oh, look, we plant different food for the deer. So, yeah, the, the idea that you've got a, a farm and you really – are doing, you, you know, you're doing your thing and in your way, you guys are doing your thing on that farm. It was definitely people around the, uh, your farm are paying attention to that. And at times that can get, when you realize that, Hey, they're doing it too. Let's let, and they're like, yeah, let's try and grow some older deer. What do you say? Let's, we'll do this. We'll kind of do the same thing. And it becomes interesting to them. And so then they, they want to do some of that. And I, I get that a lot where I'll do a farm and then a neighbor wants another one and the neighbor sees it and they want it done. And that's generally what happens. A lot of those cells grow because everybody realizes, Hey, there's kind of a different way we can do this. Well, there's, there's a lot of debate about that online right now. There, you got your old school hunters, and I'm going to call myself an old school hunter because I started out, you know, many years ago with the drives and the big groups mm-hmm. and the families and the farms. So did I. And, um, you know, I, I don't do that anymore, obviously, but I still know a lot of people that do. And they look at what we're doing now, and I'll be honest with you, it, first, deer were scored by you know, inches and stuff at first and by points and then by width. We talked about this the other day and then we started doing the age thing and it's, it's caught on big time. You know, everybody's talking age now. I mean, everybody's talking age, but that's really the core of, of our system, if you will. And when I say our, I mean, everybody that we have interacted with in, in the past. You know what I mean? I look back at Miles Keller and Mitch and Steve Snow and all them guys back in the day. We all know them. We're all, all friends with them. And, you know, 
they started shooting 140s and 150s, and everybody's like, oh, that's not sustainable on TV, and it's all about, you know, remember that, going through that pr- progression, and then Pat, and, and everybody started coming up on that? Well, now the age thing, you know, it doesn't have to be the score. It's the age thing, you know. And age, to me, is the challenge. It's, but all, you know, because like you say, every, every deer's got a different personality. Mm-hmm. Some are easier to kill than others, you know. And age, and age makes it more of a flat playing field, more nationwide in some ways because not I think so. some places have you know it's common oh it can kill 150 inch deer 170 inch deer blah 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 but hey you kill a deer in massachusetts that's 110 inches but he's seven years old that's an awesome whitetail i think so and then and, and, and then, it levels it you know you know but it, once again i even hate to refer to online because it's so petty when you watch some of the stuff people are saying but you'll see a post about oh yeah everybody's it's got to be a four and a half if it's a doesn't matter what it is, kill it. And I, everybody agrees with that. If you're excited to shoot a deer, go shoot a deer. Nobody cares sure. about that. But if you're progressing and you're looking for challenge and you don't want, if you want that change for the sport, for yourself, and you want to participate in that, I mean, I think we're doing a great thing, you know. But if you don't want to and you still want to shoot everything that's running and go with your buddies and see how many you can stack up, I don't have a problem with that either. No, at the end of the day, you're chasing your deer. I don't care what other people are doing. Right. I've got deer to worry about. Exactly. JJ, would you agree with that? You've got, are you more worried about an eight-year-old buck or what uh, somebody that comments on, online is doing? You're eight-year-old chasing, buck. But I, I would say deer, this. You know? I, I think it's a good thing that people, you know, you have all different types of hunters and meat hunters and people that drive and this and sure. that because, you know, everybody gets Public upset. Public land or, hunters. I have, you know, I have absolutely nothing to say about an, the way anybody hunts whitetail deer. Mm-hmm. It is a free country. That's what's great about America. You do it your way, and I'll, I'll say nothing but, pro- hey, that's great. Great job. You killed a three-pointer. Great job. Yeah, I Are tell you, you happy? Then great job. If there's something that we can do to make you right. more successful at the sport has been pretty much our mission statement from day one. When I started this company, that's the God's truth. What were you going to say, Well, where I was going with that is even like just population control because like the way we do it, I we need people to shoot more deer because if well, we, we do. don't, with what we do with the management practices, mm-hmm. we're going to have way too many deer, way too many does. Yeah. So I see even coyotes running around and I know people get all upset. Oh, they're going to kill fawns. They're going to get all the deer. Okay, well, we can't shoot them all. I don't want to shoot seven does a year, so... If coyotes get a couple, I think that's okay. Well, that's my take on it. We need to keep deer under control too, because I don't want 70 does on the property. I'm becoming more tolerant of that. It used to be when we first got the property, it's like, oh, a deer got killed. Oh, that deer's gone. You know, we used to get a little riled up about that. But now I'm with JJ. It's like, you know, well, there was a sick fawn died in the cornfield. I found that when we were shed hunting. Um, we're not finding many wounded animals anymore like we used to but then that hunting pressures off when i talked about neighbors i'm talking about right on the property lines Mm -hmm. that's kind of not the same anymore so that's 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 lightened up a lot so we're not seeing a bunch of dead deer running into the property for sanctuary and dying on it where we did the first few years where it was at least three a year um and then of course you got car kills you're seeing those so yeah, I, I because remember. the populations are you know exploding with what we do. Oh, big time! Yeah, yeah. and and at the and same the time, at the same time, those deer are learning. Hey, the neighbors is dangerous, and so that's why you're seeing less bucks coming on or deer coming on and dying on the property. They're also learning. That, it's hey, not just the, the. I'm not freaking going. I'm, I'm gonna just, stay here. It's <laughs> not just the deer; it's the turkeys too. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're going in there and doing food food plot stuff and everything, and working on stuff, and we're turkey hunting at the same time. Which, by the way, I'm supposed to be out there right now. Um, but you'll go in there and you'll set a blind or do something. And all of a sudden you look at a camera 45 minutes later, they're right back in there. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's, that's not the way it was when I used to turkey hunt. You blew them out of there. Oh, they're gone for a day or two before they come back. Yeah. It just goes back to the no pressure thing. I mean, there's there's, building human, building trust in humans. Those animals, they feel comfortable there. They don't feel threatened. I mean, it's, I look at in the last three years, you guys have shot those two deer, you know, and remember, there's that there's that other component too that those resources. Yep. When you have that level of resources, you know it's like somebody comes into your you you've got everything you need in a situation. Somebody comes in and, and runs you out of there. You where are you gonna go? You okay. stand there for a minute. You're like, well, because I'm going back. I'm gonna make a comment, and then JJ and um, Andy can take over here. But 
chopping corn in the in the fields because we're getting ready to plant again, there was a lot, I don't, I don't know about a lot, but there was quite a bit of corn left in every one of the plots this year. First time ever. So good to know. Take good it over. Yeah, there you go. What, take it over. Need. What are we going to do now? And there was beans left over from the year from the uh, open where we're putting the switchgrass. So. Yeah. Well, that just goes into every year. You learn more about the property, how much corn you need standing. You know, this year we didn't have any snow, so they're out eating in the picked, you know, our already picked fields too. It's not like it was three, four feet of snow and they only had our standing corn. Mm -hmm. Deer were dispersed. I was actually going to hit on something I noticed in the past couple of weeks or my, my brain's starting to click on the turkey front. Every day, these turkeys roost to the west where, you know, open big timber. They go east and they go in Cedar Springs. There has to be so many nests in these hinge cuts in Cedar Springs because that's where all the turkeys and hens and like it's creating so much nesting habitat too right yeah. now. I just it's not to... on the west. Big no, timber. It's all it is, yeah, it's, hinge cut, it is not on grassy. The west. You know, yeah. regrowth. I just posted a picture on my uh, face on the Advanced Whitetail Systems Facebook page of a hen sitting on a hinge cut log with uh, five or six poults, and that's an important component. You got to remember it when you when you have an open timber, there is no place for those babies to go for the three weeks that they can't fly. They just run around and sleep on the ground, and they get picked off by everything because anything that can find them, they just patrol until they find them. Well, you got hinge cutting, they can get underneath it. So they've got protection from aerial predators and they can hop on it almost immediately. They do. They, and they, they hop up, it. they get up and they get up off the ground. And I then watched they're, they're, it happen. Little so tiny chicks go from the ground all the way up into as high as they can get. Yeah, you'll you'll see a huge, a big explosion in turkey population for sure. They they love hinge cutting and pheasants and quail love it too. I don't know if you guys can hold quail up here, but no, haven't seen any quail. But down down south where I'm from in uh, southeast Iowa, quail love it too. But <clears throat> so it's it's a component that benefits turkeys huge <laughs> for sure. Absolutely, yeah. So back to Mike's question. I mean, what's what's the next move from there? You know, I I look at it. You've really, so you went from not having enough food to hold these deer in the winter, right? To one of the main goals on the property was to put more food in so we could hold more deer in the winter. Well, you put more, you left more ag standing. You did more hinge cutting, which, you know, that provides a food source during those, mm -hmm. the, that time too. So now you're at the point, you had a lot of corn left over, beans left over. What's next step? What's next? <clears throat> more diversity, more little plots, more breaking things up, more... Probably more hinge cutting coming mm -hmm. over on the west side. Our logger didn't show yeah. up. He ghosted me. Yeah, so. I cannot wait to get on the west <laughs> okay, side of the property. Okay, let me bring that sure. up. Okay, so we decided, um, we, we held off on the west side, obviously, we know, because we didn't know what we were going to do. And then we added additional property. Well, what we found out is that's really not, we don't feel comfortable with the hinge cut scenario there because we want to harvest the timber because there's some value in the timber there. Oh, for okay. sure. Okay, so... We're talking about taking the tops and creating the habitat almost like a hinge cut that way. And then, of course, you got a lot of, you know, junk trees in there too. A lot so of small what, trees. What do we do next? We have to do the actual timber harvest first before mm -hmm. we can do anything else mm -hmm. and then create that infrastructure with the, you know, with the trails and whatnot and then set up those little ecosystems like JJ's talking about. So being that it's not going to be a mass hinge cut deal, what what's our next strategy yeah as far as I, I have a lot of guys that have marketable timber on their farms when we cut when we go to do hinge cutting projects and we just you know you have that marketable tim marketable timber removed first and then we'll go in and hinge cut afterwards and the, the combination is unbelievable it's unbelievable yeah it's, so what do you so like cedar springs was not you know the high quality timber it was a lot of i mean there's some Mm -hmm. nice oak in there but it was pretty, just pretty junky nice. so it was yeah. more about of, like location oh here's a good bedding let's do this let's a do lot that. of nice elm and and whatnot in there and box elder and, mm -hmm. so now the west side's going to have low quality timber potentially in areas you don't want the bedding like the bottoms or something i don't know exact strategy but and then the high quality stuff may be where you want so how do you yeah you're almost going to have to if you're going to do hinge cutting you're kind of just limited to where you can do that Right. Well, getting your marketable timber out of there first, and then you start to try and understand, as we spoke before, you know, all right, let's understand your accesses to all these various areas, and then you can plan hinge cutting from there. But you'll be surprised at how, um, you know, I've done a bunch of farms like that where they pull the marketable timber, and there's still a lot left to hinge cut. I mean, it's it doesn't take 
um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of trees. Like a, like a, an example would be on the east side of Cedar Springs. That stuff was really, really thick. Yeah. And, you know, almost almost difficult to hinge cut in there in a lot of places because you couldn't get trees to, to go to the ground because they're just so stacked in there. And so at times it can really be, I, I've had some great um, hinge cutting opportunities on farms that have had the marketable timber pulled, which leaves a lot of canopy open to, to put hinge cutting how I want it and where I want it. It really... I'll tell you what I noticed by hunting it the west side over there because I hunted the west side pretty much all, mostly all the west side is what I hunted. And so when I get up in certain areas, what I noticed is, like JJ says, it's open. So you can see the deer moving pretty from a long ways away. Mm -hmm. And when they would come in, I actually had a buck, I think it was a two-year-old, bedded right down below my tree. And what I noticed was a couple of things. One is they always bedded right next to a down log. Mm -hmm. you know, and that was kind of that comfort thing. Mm -hmm. So then I go out and I shed hunt this year. All right. And same thing, you know, that uh, actually I'm pretty sure it was a little splitter that bedded right by my stand there. And he was with a doe down next to a deadfall. Okay. So it was kind of like a little high point for him. Same kind of scenario. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then I go uh, shed hunting this spring. All the beds were on those knobs and there's got to be what, four or five knobs out on that west just on the west side of the west of, of uh, Oak Roost, you know, where I, where I, you know, we did a little bit of timber work there earlier. And anyway, the, on all them knobs, all the beds were out there on them knobs. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you could tell they were laying once again by a, an old tree laying down and they just love that. So I'm thinking, yeah, let's just use that to our advantage. But the problem is, as soon as you get out on that knob, I could see all the way across almost to the top of the other, well, to the top of the other bluffs. Yeah, Cedar Springs. I mean, you could see for on the west side. ever Over on the and west that, side. That's a super, super key principle, Mike, because they're doing that for a specific reason, and it's mm -hmm. that specific reason. It gives them the whole entire down below them side. They can see extremely well, and they'll generally bed when the wind is coming down that ridge from their back, and they can smell everything behind them, and they can see everything in front of them. So they've got a huge advantage from any got, kind of predators and you got a pretty significant um spring or creek flat down there too that's pretty wide it's at least a couple hundred yards wide in areas mm -hmm. with the natural spring going through and that's the main core yeah and you could see all of that you know what i mean mm -hmm. yeah, that's all very that's an advantage that they want and in visual. particular mature bucks really want that advantage yeah they love that and that's you know that's the location that i put a lot of the mature buck cells Mm -hmm. or on those crowns because it gives them such a huge advantage. You think about how they can get out of danger. If something shows up in the bottom below them, they just roll around the crown of that ridge and they're in two seconds, they're, they're invisible because can, they're in the gut between the two crowns, you know? So I can think of four to a half a dozen of those, what you're talking about right there, where there's points where they're not close enough to another buck where that wouldn't even affect them. Mm -hmm. Just on oak roost side alone. Yeah. And now we're not even talking about getting into the walnut area. Mm -hmm. And that's some really good resources over there with water and food. And we, we got huge, big switchgrass field going in over there. That's going to be mm -hmm. a... By that big pond? Yeah. That's the boy. That, that, we're going to be able to hold more than two deer. Yeah. Well, to wrap part of that up, don't underestimate the value of logging and then hinge cutting. Yeah. It is unbelievable. That's the, that's the double whammy. It's okay. unbelievable. The, the, the difference that it makes because you're again the real resource in the whole thing is the sun and so when you log it and hinge cut it how much sun are you getting to the ground now the explosion of of fresh green amazing high quality food growth and cover in there will be ridiculous you won't even recognize it and as you said at the beginning of what you're talking about you said oh you can see a long way in there that's bad that's horrible. That's bad, always man. bad. That's not what whitetails want. They hate it. And that's why that when they get pushed in areas like that, they'll run for 500 yards or half, you know, a, a full mile just to get away from that and get where, where coyotes and whatever else is pushing them can't see them. And what you notice in hinge cut areas is they run 150 yards and duck into another hinge cut. And then they circle. Within, within 15, 20 minutes, they circle right back to where they were. In a perfect world, we'd be able to actually have trails in that thing, and the deer won't necessarily see us. They may understand there's some, something's going on there, electric vehicles going through or checking, whatever it is, but it's not going to blow them out of there. Mm -hmm. 
They're just going to lay there and tolerate it. And that's what they're doing mm-hmm. on Cedar Springs. They're absolutely tolerating the human presence. Yeah. It's because, crazy. Because what were we talking about a half an hour ago? Yeah. Resources. Resources. I'm not leaving. They are not I tolerating love it, right it here. On, on Oak Roost side. Yeah. As soon as you see them, oh, there goes five deer 150 yards away. Mm-hmm. Resources and comfort. You think about it, you know. If you're sitting out in the middle of your driveway and something scary happens, or some, you know, some weird goofy drive up in a vehicle or something, you're going to get up and leave. You're, un- you're already partially uncomfortable. You're out of there. But if you're sitting on your couch, you look out your window and see him, and you got a, you know, your old 357 sitting next to you, you're not going anywhere. You got everything you need. You know, they have, they have what they need and they're not going to leave. We see that time after time after time. Deer that are in hinge cuts, when you approach them, they just, they'll just watch you and they're like, they've had it happen so many times with the coyotes. The coyotes don't see them when they're in those hinge cuts. They just trot on by. And so they're watching to see, is, is he even going to spot me? And if you don't stop and stare at him, you can walk by 20 yards away. Because they just don't know. They're, they think, hey, I'm not, you know, they can't see me. I'm not going anywhere. It's, yep. it's really super beneficial for the comfort level of your deer, for sure. So I want to throw a question out there. And we've talked a lot about things that you guys have done from the start and worked. And, you know, you've obviously had some success there. This is a question for JJ, you and Mike and Andy. I want your input too from kind of the outside from what you've heard now. In this whole process, there's obviously still things that you want to do moving forward, trail systems, lots of stuff that, that you can plan on. Looking back, are there any mistakes that you guys have made or anything that you look back and say, I wish we would have done that differently? I wish we would have cut the west side quicker. <laughs> hey. I got to say no. And because I haven't seen a negative effect of anything that we've done, to be honest with you. And the one that scared me the most was the driveway in the shed. And that has had zero impact. I mean, it, all it did is make the deer, I think, in the, the, actually the wildlife in general, more tolerant of light human activity on that edge. And the fact that JJ said that we did the Cedar Springs habitat first, they're comfortable in there, like Andy said, so they were actually able to tolerate it. Now, there's still a lot of improvements we need to go back there. As far as on the west side, we haven't really done a whole lot, but everything that we've done has been a positive impact. I just, I can't say that we've done anything bad yet. Oh, that's good. My, my answer would be, I, I want to chime in on, uh, do you know why they're tolerating that light human activity on, on JJ's side? Well, answer me this. What is more dangerous, a human in his sweatpants with a cup of coffee yeah. or a 45-pound male coyote? Good point. You have driven the coyotes out, and all the animals know it. It's a very, very simple thing. I see it over and over and I over and over. I did not realize that. Yeah, over and over and over. Our neighbor I see, I see it. east of there, too, hammers the coyotes He does. Hard. That That's too. a benefit. Which That's a benefit. I worry about having too many deer because of that, but also. I, I do, too. I, I'm already starting to think about seeing, like, sitting down in my little, I mean, it's going to call it almost a, it's like watching TV. I sit in my little shed down there in the, the bat blind, and I could literally, it's be like, go in there, show up, sit down, and I'm watching out a picture window, just like at my house, deer coming in and interacting naturally every single day, day in and day out. Somebody would come in the farm, we rent out the house, come in, bump them out of there, they'd filter back in, the bucks would show up. I'd just watch all this stuff happen all throughout the whole season, every single day, and I I don't know, it's just... it's just a really weird, really weird scenario. I'm thinking that if they're that comfortable, we got to start taking, some, not quite yet, but we're going to have to start taking out some does and how are we going to do that without leaving a bloodbath? And uh, know, I believe you are the owner of a 10-point crossbow, sir. I am. <laughs> that is probably the most effective way to do it during bow season. It is, they just don't know what's happening. And you can put some great meat in the freezer and you'd be happy. And That's a good point because there has not been a gun fired on that property in four years. That I never thought about that until earlier today I was thinking about that. It's like, why are these turkeys staying on the property? 
Because people are shooting shotguns all around us trying to kill them. Well, you know, they, why they, are the deer staying here? Well, people are shooting guns all around us. Mm-hmm. There's never been a firearm shot on that property since we purchased it. Yeah, and that's that sanctuary component for sure. You know, they they feel completely safe there. They've got all the resources they need, and they're learning. Remember, you can go and create all those resources, but they don't have any experience, personal experience with them. That has to build over time. And now you're in year three, moving into year four, and they're building every day personal experience with, uh, it sucks when I leave this property. I'm staying here. I'm happy here every minute I'm here. And then I leave and I encounter somebody that's on a four-wheeler or somebody shooting a gun. It scares the crud out of me. I have to run back to where I'm comfortable. And they're, they're building those experiences every day. And that's exactly what, you know, the principle of uh, uh, creating a property like this and conserving a property like that. So now when let's just talk about that strategic selective harvest. So what are you going to do? You just want to uh, hunt your, your does and whatever you're going to be taking on the exterior of the property and keep the gut piles and everything out on the exteriors. Would if you a deer goes in there, you pull it out of that hinge cut and you gut it somewhere. I mean, what what's the strategy there without Yeah. I, I can speak to that as far as my my strategy on that kind of thing is yes, haul that deer out of there. Do not gut it on the property. Uh, do everything you can to become the best marksman you can so that you're not having long blood trails. You've got short blood trails on solid double lung hit deer that, that go, you know, between 50 and 150 yards and they're out. And just, yeah, do everything you can to reduce that pressure. When you go to retrieve a deer, um, you know, minimum lights, don't be, you know, yelling, bush light can thrown over your shoulder. <laughs> yeah. The old days, you know, mm-hmm. just do everything you can to to remember what you just said a minute ago, you know, you're they're, they're building trust with the property and you're trying to sneak in there and just surgically just, you know, just think, just remove, remove it just as carefully as you can and do as little, have as little impact. You, you guys are now realizing that every single thing you do on that property, you're dealing with an animal that is, can easily understand everything you're doing on the property. Everything. They're in there at night. The old, the old saying was, you know, bucks do their homework at night. And it's the truth. They're in there at night. If you hang a trail camera, walk, do it sometime. Walk into the center of that property, touch a leaf, and then hang a trail camera on and leave. And yeah. watch what happens. Yeah, we know there will that. Be, there will be 15 <laughs> deer that smell that individual leaf, and they'll stand there and process information in their head, and then they'll leave. And they won't come back. And the mature you, bucks won't. And then the you hunt somewhere won't. else the next morning. Hmm? <laughs> then you, yes, you hunt somewhere else. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> no, but I'm saying what, my, what I'm speaking to is the capacity of that animal to understand changes within its environment. They're, they're, you know, people, you hear people say, oh, chickens are stupid. Cows are stupid, whatever. Turkeys are stupid because they, they can die just from rain falling in their beak and they'll die or whatever, blah, blah, blah. All animals, in my opinion, mo- almost all animals have tremendous intelligence and capacity to understand certain aspects of their life and their environment. Turkeys are a prime example. They don't understand what a blind is at all. They'll walk right up to it. They have no clue. That's a weakness in their defense. But you try and move as a human being through the timber and have a turkey not see you. They're, you know, they're, they're rocket scientists in their own ways. And that's what you're dealing, that's what you're learning now with your deer is that your deer are, can perceive the changes within their environment with incredible intelligence, you know. So just, yeah, trying to, to, to circle back on your deer. Oh, my gosh, I just quoted Jen Psaki. Anyway, to circle back on that, um, uh, yeah, doing everything you can to surgically remove deer without causing any, any uh, make, put great shots on them, gut them somewhere else, haul them off the property, you know, just, just do it that way so that you're reducing your pressure. And you can harvest. I know guys that have harvested six or seven deer a sit. Because I does. would, I would ne- we would never kill does, you know what I mean, because we don't want to screw up getting that buck because we don't want to we don't want to blow the property up you know what i mean mm-hmm. so but i think a guy could get away with some of that yeah especially for sure if we get a lot of different areas especially if we get oak roost style then that's the only be- other thing i would add to that is is in my opinion don't become focused um on uh old does don't focus on old doe. Oh, it's you mean a, the it's one a that big... keeps blowing at me and circling it's my a... stand and looking up and no focus on that one. <laughs> focus on that one for okay, sure. If they, that's a rule sure for I me got... anyway. If they blow, they are toast. <laughs> but don't focus on the old. You hear a lot of guys. You know, oh, it's an old swamp donkey. That's the third one I got this week. You know, don't focus on a single age structure of doe because remember those does in in the in the in the capacity of thinking of your property as a yeah. whole, including the deer. Those older does are incredibly smart. 
and they know things about how to how to how to escape danger, where to find water when it's super hot, how to raise fawns. They become excellent at raising fawns. You don't want to harvest just them. You know, you can harvest yeah. a, a few of them, a few mid-aged structure deer, and you know, even a year and a half year olds. That's fine. But the year but and a half, two and a half year old does are the best eaters. Anyway. Oh my gosh, they're amazing. They yeah, amazing and uh, so I, I try and really have a spectrum of age yeah. of doe that you don't focus. Realize that old girl. She's she's a very valuable resource unless she's blowing at yeah, you. She's a real she's valuable. Go. She's a valuable resource <laughs> for your property because she knows things about coyotes that the other deer don't know. How to escape them, and you know, just something I see a lot. Well, we're going to have to wrap up here. Mike's got to get out the turkey blind. It's calling your name, I think. Are we going? Ten, ten, po- ten point redemption. You no, you got to do coming. another podcast. Let's do all the things that Mike wants to do. We, we, we could do a podcast out from the turkey blind. That's how, how big is that blind? We could fit all, I'm all in. four or five We'll just put in two blinds out there. Oh, that'd be perfect, actually. It'd be pretty slick. Turkeys wouldn't know what hit them. No. Well, you just said. They don't know what right. a turkey... I wonder Set what up they two do blinds two side blinds. by side, drop the windows in between them, we could have a little party. That's right. It'd be perfect. <laughs> well, one of the cool things that's coming with the Whitetails from Scratch property, in my opinion, is you know when you guys bought the property, you were already dealing with the age structure that was there, right? And, and it wasn't a good age structure. Now what you're dealing with is, you know, three, four years in, you're building your own age structure. You're seeing those deer that are growing up with the changes you guys are making. So that's really cool. It's going to be really exciting because you've been able to document these deer, you know, run and reveals all the time, document these deer from one, two, three, four years old. So telling that story and see those deer grow up all within that same property is going to be pretty exciting stuff. So yeah. Go ahead, uh, I just had one thing to add. I'm sorry. It, it's just something I noticed since I came in here. You guys are here every day and you're interacting with each other. And so you probably don't notice it as much as I did coming from the outside. Since I've been here, I've heard all of you comment on little facets of the property and things that need to be done and overlaid and finished and do. You guys are now a community. You've, you've formed a friendship group, a family group that is now all focused. Imagine what that has done for your success overall. I heard JJ say, you better take some clippers. There's a bunch of prickly ash in there. You were commenting on the blind. There was a blind that blew away. You guys are working as a team now to, to create that farm. That is a gigantic uh, um, asset and improvement. It's amazing. It's, it, it's a, it, I would argue that it almost becomes more important than the hunting component for you guys individually. You're now members of a group that are all focused on the same thing. And that has its own importance for you guys. That's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Because and it's it, changed it, into something else. Well, and it's also morphing into overall wildlife. You know, we're mm-hmm. starting to see, well, I mean, there's eagles. There's, yeah. I mean, you know, we got badgers. And I know people don't like badgers, but if you hate gophers as much as I do, you like badgers. Sure. Um, uh, river otters coming in, taking on the turtles, uh, waterfall. We want to create a little waterfall habitat. Yeah. What else? Mink. There's just lots of stuff out there. You've turned oh, your attention and- from the tech world that we live in. You know, you're turning your attention to outside as a group and you work together as a team. Well, that's, even, that's amazing. That's, even, that's what everybody wants. That's amazing. Hey, even just the hunting strategy in the fall, it's like we bounce ideas around mm-hmm. different properties even um, within the team. And then when we were hunting this year, it wasn't like I shot skyscraper or you you shot little splitter. Oh, it was no. like we shot this. We got it. Yeah. Everybody's hunting the same stance, same I prom- strategy, I promise same you wind. That this is you the know? most one of the one of the greatest things that'll ever happen in your well, life. Well, I'm going to make a point Super on that cool. because when Proud I went of all up, you guys and amazing. when I went up to see that deer and he walked me over to it, what was the first words that come out of his mouth? You put your hands on him first. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> who who does that? But it like somebody with respect. Well, it's our it's our it, the, the point is, is that we all work so hard. Mm-hmm. He wanted to give me, you know, that uh, something special as mm-hmm. well. Is that he experienced special as well with that deer? And, yeah, and we know, all, you know, there's nothing you, better than that. Right, you know that uh, from the beginning you know that the harder you work for something the more it means to you. And you guys are just grinding now and just improving and and respecting that property in every way that you can and that increase, it's just, it's just a multiplier for your enjoyment every step of the way, every single thing you do. Well, and that's, you know, just 
that's why we do what we do. You know, everybody does it to, for the adrenaline rush and because we enjoy hunting and we enjoy, you know, harvesting deer and, and that kind of thing. But in the end, we do it for the camaraderie. We do it for the experience. We, we do it, you guys do it to make your property better. And, and it's, it's about all the work that goes in right now. It's so exciting in preparation for the fall. It's not just the fall. I mean, you can you guys experience hunting yeah. in that atmosphere year round. Right now, we're experiencing it's the it, so. ultimate season extender. Yeah, that's, that's it a just great, is. Great way to put it. Uh, guys love to say, you know, I hunt deer three sixty five, and that's all you're trying to do. Absolutely. Well, on that note, we are going to wrap this thing up. We're all going to go jump in turkey blinds. So, uh, <laughs> thanks for watching. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe. Uh, download the Deer Society app. It's free. Check that out. Lots of good information on there. Lots of good stuff coming all throughout the spring. More stuff from Andy coming here. So lots of good stuff. Thanks for watching, tuning in, and uh, we'll catch you here next time. The time's ticking. Well, I'm a deer hunting man. Well, I'm a deer hunting The Deer Society's success has been built on great partnerships with great product makers, such as Illusion Systems, maker of the Extinguisher Deer Call, the Black Rack Rattling System, and the Phase Body Odor System, Tacticam and Reveal, Osseo Gear, 10 Point Crossbows, Burris Optics, Huyman, and Big Frig.